How many people in the room voted in the last federal election? <laughs> All right, so that's a good number. I'd say about a third of you. Um, so it, it depends. Um, uh, there's a selection bias in the room to an extent. The kind of people who would come out to a TED talk in the middle of a polar vortex are a particular type of people. And kudos to you. Um, but it's not necessarily representative of broader trends in the population. Uh, in fact, if we look at voter turnout since Confederation, uh, we see some alarming uh, trends. Specifically, if we look at the trend line throughout the course of the election, or throughout the course of uh, Confederation to the present. And that trend is a significant decline in voter turnout. When we dig into the uh, age dynamics of that decline, we find that voter turnout is particularly low young, among young people. And I know that this isn't a, uh, a groundbreaking claim, but it's important to note that especially if you look at people within the age ranges of 18 to 24 and 25 to 34, less than 50% of eligible voters in those age, age ranges vote. Now, um, for the most part, young people are often um, blamed as being apathetic. They're accused of being apathetic, and that this is a uh, sort of a, a shameful thing, that they should engage in the process, uh, that we should all be engaged in this process, and that this apathy is, is our own agency, and we should try to eliminate it. Uh, but actually, what we see is that I don't think it's apathy that's the problem. I think that it is a resigned complacency about a system that we no longer feel we have the ability to change. Uh, if we look at cynicism, if we look at disenfranchisement among all citizens, not of any particular age group, but among all citizens, you see there's been a steep decline uh, since 1965. And this is taking data from the Canadian election study, uh, which lets us look at affinity towards parties and politics. You see that decline is particularly pronounced, though, again, among young people. In this case, among people under the age of 34, well below the average, well below the other two age groups, and, and a sharp decline. Now, this uh, resigned complacency is a privilege. Uh, there are many places around the world where uh, complacency means a loss of livelihood, means a loss of liberty, and it means a loss of life. Uh, so we're privileged to be in a place where we can have this complacency around our government and around our politics. That said, I think it's also a problem when we shame people uh, who don't turn out to vote for the purposes of, uh, because they're cynical, because they don't feel that the system speaks to them, because they don't feel that they're engaged, because they feel disenfranchised. And I think that the, the lack of civic engagement says more about the state of our democracy than it necessarily does about our citizens. And I think that's an issue. Um, so we're in an information age, and it seems almost absurd to me that in an information age, we wouldn't have uh, more means by which to engage with the mechanisms of government and with the political institutions that, are set, that govern us. Uh, so uh, what, what I did is try to create a very small crack in this uh, seemingly impenetrable structure uh, that causes this apathy and disenfranchisement, and that's uh, Vote Compass. Now, Vote Compass is based on a simple premise, and the premise is that citizens should have access to uh, information about how political parties are positioned on a range of issues. Uh, that information should be straightforward, it should be as free of spin and rhetoric as it can be, and it should allow an easy comparison, an easy framework for engagement with politics and with election campaigns. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people would say, this already exists. Uh, you know, Parties go out and they campaign on certain promises during election campaigns, and they have political platforms. So I'm going to do another straw poll. How many people in this room, in the last federal election, read every page of every platform of every political party? Just for curiosity. Nice, nice. <laughs> OK, we have a few. Uh, far fewer than voted, though. Um, and you know what? I don't blame you. Uh, these political platforms uh, are marketing materials in many ways. Uh, they talk past each other instead of to each other. Uh, they, they create a discourse that is characterized by rhetoric and spin and attack ads. 
and it makes it difficult for us to engage with them uh, in a substantive and meaningful way. So what we did with Vote Compass is we said, well, let's take all of the information that's available to us. Let's take all of the data we can get. And we took a team of political scientists, looked at every public disclosure that was made by the political parties uh, in the lead up to the election campaign. And we coded it and we put it into a, an application that allows users to easily organize, sort, and assess their alignment with the political parties. Uh, so the, the application is really quite simple. Uh, you access the application, you answer a series of questions that are topical in an election campaign, um, ranging across a variety of issues, and I should say far more issues than are normally prevalent in the discourse of an election campaign. You assess how important each of those issues are to you, or each of those issue clusters are to you. You get to assess the leaders and the parties. And based on that assessment, it shows you a very simple sense of how you align with the political parties in the run-up uh, during the election campaign. How your views correspond with their views. How your priorities correspond with their parties. And it lets you dig deeply into each of the questions and the various data that's been used to arrive at that calibration. So it's a simple idea. Uh, it's one of those ideas that you, you probably are saying, OK, how, how come that doesn't already exist? Um, I actually had that question. Uh, and, but even though it's a simple idea, it had a, an incredible amount of traction. And I think that that traction demonstrates that we are a society that wants to be engaged. We are a society that wants to be part of the political process. But the mechanisms that enable us to do that in a digital age are absent. Um, to give you a sense of why I think that, look at the traction that Vote Compass has had to date. Uh, we've, had th we've already had three ma major media partners worldwide. So the CBC and Radio Canada have sponsored five editions of Vote Compass, um, one in the Canadian election campaign and, and four provincial elections. We ran an edition of Vote Compass in the 2012 presidential election with the Wall Street Journal. And we recently concluded an edition with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation for the Australian federal election. So we've had seven iterations in three different countries and also at the provincial level. And in that time, we've had five million people worldwide uh, take, this, take this survey and learn more about how they align with the political parties. Now that to me is a massive number. Two million people in the Canadian federal election campaign alone, 1.4 million people in the Australian campaign, uh, so this is a huge, I think, win for new mechanisms and new media, me new media for engagement in a digital age. Um, what it also does, though, is it gives us an incredible uh, resource in terms of understanding public opinion. So it doesn't end with the tool. It doesn't end with Vote Compass. When people use Vote Compass, they also engage in a practice of public expression that we don't have many outlets for. Even though we have all these, you know, even though we have social media, even though we have um, blogs, even though we have YouTube, uh, the way we can speak directly to, gov to government is limited because you need representative samples and representative um, uh, studies in order to convince government that what's being said by the citizens is indeed accurate. Um, well, and I'll, I'll come back to that in one moment. I think that I, I, what I was really impressed about when looking at the data from Vote Compass is that you definitely see a high engagement among young people. And again, I think that that's saying, you know, there, there need to be new mechanisms for young people to engage in politics, and they need to be mechanisms that are within the context that young people already operate in. So earlier on, I spoke about how uh, little participation and how low voter turnout there was for young people in election campaigns. But if you look at uh, the participation in Vote Compass in the yellow bars versus voter turnout, you see that these kinds of mechanisms are much more likely to see young people engage, to see them being uh, uh, participants in our democracy and in the decisions that affect them. Um, now let's look at the data. Here you see a map, uh, a time lapse sequence of the Canadian federal election campaign. And this is the data from Vote Compass. In it, you see all the themes play out that happened during the election campaign. So you see what, what was called the orange surge in Quebec, uh, the NDP really taking a stronghold in Quebec. You see uh, really the demise of the Liberal Party in, in many constituencies across the country. You see the Conservatives pick up ridings in the 905 area in, in southern Ontario. Uh, 
what this does is it tells a story, a really fascinating story about what's happening during the campaign, and it does it with vote compass data. What's important about that is that people usually say that data that comes in through the internet, through online sample, is not representative, so we can't take it seriously. And I agree with that in cases where you're talking about a thousand person sample. Uh, when you're talking about two million people from all over the country who choose to express their voice and who choose to have a voice in politics and say where they stand on certain issues, well, that's a much different story. There are methods and methodologies and, and techniques that can take massive data sets like that and they can actually reflect the opinions of the public back to the public, giving them a powerful voice to say to government, look, you know, we may have voted you in uh, on the horse race, but it doesn't mean that we agree with every position in your policy platform. Uh, in fact, we, there are, there's a heterogeneity of interests and values and preferences among the population, and we need to be more attuned to the complexities of our society. And so the, my colleagues and I who brought Vote Compass to Canada, uh, we then decided there needs to be a next step. This data is valuable. It can be a means to really uh, push democratic expression. And so we've created an, an institution called VoxPop Labs. Now, VoxPop is actually a bit tongue in cheek. Uh, VoxPop is from the Latin Vox Populi, which, is, uh, which means voice of the people. Uh, but also among journalists, and those of you in the room who have uh, who are practicing journalists or have practiced journalism will know that a vox pop is also the common parlance for the sort of person on the street interview, the streeter. When you see news clips and they go on the street and they randomly interview people about a certain subject, it's called a vox pop. Now, typically, vox pops are non-representative. You, you, you select a few people on the street, you, you don't know necessarily what the, uh, how, rep how much that reflects public sentiment. But if you do enough of them, if you ask enough people enough important questions about uh, as, uh, topical issues that matter, if you get two million people answering these vox pops, then you can actually weight and match that data using population estimates, using the census, using other population estimates in such a way as to make that data representative. And this is a powerful tool for democracy. So at Vox Pop Labs, we want to do three things. We want to engage people with with tools like Vote Compass that uh, exist in the context and operate in the context in which people currently operate, one that's accessible to the public, uh, and then we want to inform the public because there's a lot to be said for getting out the vote. There's something else to be said for getting out an informed vote, and a really robust democracy requires an informed vote. And finally, taking the data, taking people's sentiment, and reflecting it back to society allows us to empower the public in ways that they've not previously been empowered. And what I mean by that is that it's all well and fine for a politician to say that this is how Canadians think and this is how Canadians feel about this issue. But that's typically taken from spurious data at best. What I would like to do and what this institution is aiming to do is take these types of data and actually say how Canadians think about issues. Because we can do fine-grained research. We can look uh, across demographics, across constituencies, at a very fine level. And that helps us to learn about ourselves, and it helps us to learn about each other. And I think that's something that's missing in the, the, the polarization of contemporary politics, is that we don't know enough about each other, and so we rush to judgments on the opinions of others that are different from ours, instead of trying to learn to understand them. And these kinds of data sets can get us there. So we can look at big issues like the war in Afghanistan and how the different constituencies riding by riding differ. And that's important. But we can also look at why they differ and what are the underlying causes and mechanisms and how can we find a path forward together uh, which, which speaks to all of our interests and values and preferences and goals. Now we've gone even further. So we, we're not only looking at vote compass data, now we're looking at big data writ large. So on Twitter, in other social media aspects, we're able to look at these data sets and we're able to uh, find where public sentiment is and try to get and, and build credibility in these methods so that governments have to be held accountable uh, to the will of the public. Now this isn't a perfect path. It's not, it's not one, two, three democracy. It really is, uh, uh, there are perils along the way. Some of the perils are that we're not trying to build digitally mediated populism, and that's important. 
We, we live in liberal democratic societies in Canada and elsewhere, and the judiciary has a role, and legislators have a role, and, if you, and, and these roles are important and they should be acknowledged. What we're trying to do is make them more responsive. Um, there are many other data sets out there that, are trying to, that, that people use in, in, in efforts to manipulate us, to manipulate our views, to polarize the discourse, to, to further their own ends. So we want to put out in good faith uh, data that is actually reflective of the way people are thinking about politics, of, of their families, of their societies, and how they can move forward. Um, I'll end on a quote from George Bernard Shaw, which is, uh, democracy is a device that ensures we shall be governed no better than we deserve. And I think that's important. We are custodians of our own liberties. We're stewards of our own freedom. And to that extent, we need to find ways to ensure that as our, as our societies move forward, that we maintain the fundamentals of democracy by ensuring that they're reflected through new media, new means, new mechanisms for making sure that the public will and the public interest is of the ultimate value. So I appreciate your time and thank you very much.